Okay, so next up we have lightning talks. Uh, they're going to be very fast, and there's a lot of bright people who put their titles uh, to sign up for lightning talks, but apparently they didn't put their names. Uh, so if you see your title, if I call it, please come up and sit on uh, these two empty seats up here. And hey everyone, so as Renshin just said, we are going to be doing lightning talks in this room, so don't go anywhere. All right, lightning talks, they're starting right here. All right, so the first lightning talk we have for today, Trump's Twitter tirada. And next up we have Null, what is Null? So if the title of your talk is Null, what is Null? Please come sit up, awesome. All right, Trump's Twitter tirada. Can I have your name? Peter. All right, guys, we have Peter up here for Trump's Twitter tirada. Put your hands together. This works? Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Perfect. I'll try. Yep. All right, so the way this works is every talk has a five minute time limit, and we have a one minute remaining marker, so which we'll show to the uh, speaker. And at the end of the five minutes, we're going to start clapping no matter how interesting the talk is or who it is. All right? Yeah. Thank you. Am I on? Okay. Hey, everyone. So I thought I'd bring you a relic of the past, uh, the former president's tweeting habits. Uh, so I won't enter the minefield of uh, digging the content of it, just some uh, data about uh, how he used the platform. So he started tweeting back in May 20, uh, like 2009. And then uh, he definitely didn't use the platform too much in the first two years. And yeah, then in the next period, things a little bit got out of hand. So uh, as you can see in the first period, it was like 36 tweets per month. And then here it was over 1,100. So yeah, he, he got quite acquainted. And then come the time when he became a nominee. So you can notice this downward trend. I guess uh, their team, his team was like telling him not to like be, be more... Uh, yeah, you know, keep, 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 uh, refrain a bit. And then he became president and, and that happened. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he, he really liked uh, tweeting, as, as you all know. Uh, these are all the tweets, at least until uh, uh, May uh, 2020, so we don't have the last period. And, uh, yeah, and this is the number of times these tweets were retweeted. I mean, I'll go back one and, and then show you again. It, it really tells you the story of, like, uh, how interesting he was uh, perceived uh, by the community before he became a nominee. We, we call this the Trump's Twitter trumpet. Uh, we, we don't know what this, what this bump is yet, but uh, if you can help us out, that, I'd be very glad to see. Okay, so there are a couple of ways you can see these uh, tweets. So for example, see the categories of original tweets, retweets, and replies. And if you, see the, if you check the trends side by side, he actually like, kind of forgot this uh, reply function of the platform uh, right around the time he became, he became president. And, uh, and actually this, this huge uptake, this huge surge in the number of tweets, well, a majority of it comes just from retweets towards the, the end of this period. And uh, especially if you, can, if you take a look at the, the shares of the tweets per month, there are months here where over 50% of the tweets were just retweets from, from, some, from another account. Okay, an another aspect would be like what platform he used to send those tweets. Uh, first he was uh, mainly using the web interface and then he switched to his favorite Android phone. And right around the time he became president, actually that was taken away from him because of uh, security concerns. And if we aggregate the number of tweets per platform, it can be seen that, that iPhone is leading the way with over 20,000 tweets sent just from that platform. It's already like 45,000 tweets or something in, in, this, uh, in this database. Okay, and uh, the lastly, we can take a look at the time uh, when, when these uh, tweets were sent. So this is a 24-hour clock with AM on the right and PM on the left. And uh, especially interesting if we filter it down to specific periods, so when he was being a businessman, uh, the, the, there is this, uh, like, like 
yeah, surge here around 3 p.m. and and the the early morning uh, tweet trends. So we have over 73 we have 73 tweets sent between 3 and 3:15 a.m. Uh, whereas when he became president, uh, this peak is uh, at around uh, like eight or nine in the morning. Sorry, eight, and and the the early morning or or midnight tweet trends are gone. So these were just a couple of insights that I wanted to share with you. And there is one more thing. So this whole presentation is within a Jupyter notebook, uh, did with uh, this tool that we are developing uh, called IPyVisu. And I'll be actually delivering a tutorial of it next morning, 9 a.m. on the fifth floor. So come join us and. We'll be having a fun time building similar stories, but I mean, you're gonna be doing most of the work. I'm just staying around and, and vouching for you. And if you're interested, I mean, you can also start at ipivisu.com to get more info. And if you go to bit.li uh, per ttt hyphen story or ttt hyphen notebook, you can get the notebook that I used here or just the interactive HTML that I exported from it. Thank you very much for your attention. Cool, awesome, super fast. Um, Null, what is Null is up next. Uh, Cameron is going after this. Can I have your name? Oh. Sammy Sadu. All right, everyone give it up for Sammy. I apologize for the wall of text. Uh, this was supposed to be a blog post, but I'll present this. I don't. I have no idea why that's happening. <laughs> um, cool. Um, so this is something where I think a lot of people already know this, but this is something that was really interesting to me and something I didn't learn until quite recently. But it's about null. Like, what is null? And I think. The, the main thing is that if you ask someone who's like a database programmer versus someone who's like, a, let's say, a Python programmer, they would give you two very different answers. So a programmer would probably tell you that a null is a type of value that points to nothing, right? or, or it's, a, it's a value that essentially points to no valid object. But if you asked a database person, they would probably tell you that null is a mask for having no value. And so that's pretty interesting because it's like, in programming, null is a value, but in databases, it's the lack of. And so that's something that's really interesting about that is when someone says, oh, it's a null value, compare, when you're talking about a database, that's actually kind of an oxymoron. Um, so because of this, when we talk about like a data frame where you're manipulating data in a programming language, which definition should we use? And so with some code, we're going to kind of play around with that and actually see like what is the most appropriate one. OK. Um, the next step is like talking about like why does this matter? So in data systems, we actually use null for whenever we're dealing with missing data. So that could be something like the value hasn't happened yet, or it could be something like we're doing a join, a special type of join where it has missing values, or you might do something like a, a fancy aggregation, like uh, using a cube or a rollup. OK, cool. Let's go into an example where we have Monty Python movies, right? And so we have the title, uh, we have the year, and we have the review score. And in this, we're just using a really quick SQLite example where we fill in the data. So we insert these movies. Um, then we actually run a query and actually see, OK, we want to figure out what movies have a score that do not equal to 7.5. And we see you know, we have two movies here, and they do have scores that are not equal to 7.5. Now let's throw, uh, put a null in there. So we put a new movie that just came out this year. It's unreviewed because it's new. And we run the same query. SQL actually gives us uh, the same result because the result of that new movie is null, so it's not included. OK, now let's do some fun. Let's load into Pandas. So now I read the SQL query into Pandas, and I print it out, and I see that that null is now a NAN. So it's not lack of a value. It's actually showing a marker of not a number as that value. So let's run a query now, which is let's you know, find the, the movies where the score is equal to 7.5. And we actually see that that new row, row is actually included, which is very different than the uh, SQL example we had in SQLite. And why is this the case? It's because you know, in this default behavior of pandas, we actually treat uh, null as a value rather than a marker. Um, so if you compare them, 
you actually get a Boolean value rather than something that says no or unknown or not valid. Okay, there's actually a fix to this. Uh, this has been around in Pandas for a bit, but I feel like it's uh, not commonly known. So one thing you can actually do is when you make a Pandas series, you can actually give it a D type with a capital letter. And if you do that, it actually uses a extension D type that has a bit mask to tell you if it's valid or not valid. And so if we do this, we actually see that this value now is not a NAN, but a null. And it actually has a special marker here. And when we compare stuff to it, it gives us the correct three value logic. Uh, if you compare it to a NAN, it is not a NAN. It's not sensical. And so if we actually replace this data frame with this new series and do the same query we did before, we actually get the correct result. And if we did something like, you know, if we wanted to start the right way, one thing we could do is run the query, give it a D type as a hint, and we actually get the correct data frame with the proper nulls. All right. It's just a fun, fun topic to talk about. Uh, thank you. Uh, once again, I'm Sammy. I'm an author of Daft. Uh, check out getdaft.io for our framework, and you know, stars are always appreciated. Thank you. Great, thank you, Sammy. Uh, so we have Cameron Riddle next, and after that, we have Pandas output with scikit-learn set output API by Thomas. So. I was thinking of starting my career as a stand-up comedian today, but I don't think that's happening. I, could, I couldn't come up with any jokes. I, I think I have two, which I might say later. I don't know. If you laugh, it's a joke. If you don't, forget about it. That did not help with the blue screen. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very unfortunate. <laughs> yeah, we can try many ways, but we're broken in the same way. Yeah. Okay. Um, after uh, Thomas, we have. Have you heard of DBT uh, by Burke? If you are in this room. Cool, all right. I have. <laughs> Minutes ago. Can you go to the next person? Yeah. Can you skip it? Okay. All right, so we're going with Thomas first and then Cameron after. Don't worry, I'll be back. Slides. Um, and then um, Pandas output, so I can learn. It's a thing. Anyone have heard of it? Yes. And I hear of it now. <laughs> um, this has been long in the making, three years. Um, I started three years, um, we started three years ago, and I'm grateful for all the site kind of maintainers that reviewed this pull request and spoke with me for iterating this API for three years. It's a thing now, and I'm so happy. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to showcase it um, to you right now in um, a timer, I suppose it's set, but I didn't set. <laughs> but here, here's the Cyclone API um, for um, a set output. It's not in the um, release version yet, but you could download in, um, on dev, which I'll show you at the end. Uh, programming with one hand is really hard. <laughs> no, <laughs> um, uh, I'll do this. All right, so now you have a data frame here. All right, cool, with not much stuff in it. If I use standard scalar in scikit-learn and do nothing, you, you get a NumPy array, as you may expect. But if I call set output transform equal pandas, something magical happens. It gives you a data frame. <laughs> 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 and better yet, if you um, use a pipeline, like, with, like you're scaling it and then use polynomial features, 
And um, you, saw, you see I call fit transform, like uh, I, I call transform your pandas here. Like it's a data frame with like names. Like that's, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe this took so long, but um, it did because some API design is complicated. Um, <laughs> Um, now, for heterogeneous data, um, for the Titanic data set that we all make, a lot of us learn in Machine Learning 101, um, this is a data set with categoricals and numerical data. Um, I have a preprocessor here for the numerical data. I have the, a categorical preprocessing step for the categorical data. I have a column transformer. Who knows about column transformer? Now you know now. <laughs> it helps you handle a pandas data frame and do different transforms on subsets of the data. If I call fish transform here, you notice that I didn't call the new hot um, API. It gives you a NumPy array. But if I, if I um, do set output, you could um, transform equal pandas. It's a data frame. Woo. Woo. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you see that there's like, it, 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 um, pre prefixes it with the name of the pipeline thing, I, um, of the um, how I named the preprocessing step. Um, sometimes it, it, we do that because just in case, we don't know what names overlap. But if you know for sure that um, your names don't overlap, there's a verbose option. Like I, I, in this case, uh, the names are verbose. I can set it to false, and boom. They're, they're nicer names now. <laughs> All right, so it avoids the error if, you, if your names overlap. So it's kind of nice. Um, with this feature, you get a lot of things. If you have a predictive model now, um, 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 logistic regression, like you have a preprocessor with logistic regression, it outputs, um, you see this pipeline. Oh, how many of you knew about this HTML thing? That, yeah, like this is cool, like I could click on things and like you could see like the pipeline. It's a thing, it's just, it's, it outputs it by default in Jupyter Notebook now. And if I call fit on this, um, the classifier at the very end remembers the feature names. So, so this is classifier to logistic regression. Regression is at the end. It knows the feature names that it was passed in, which means now you could connect the coefficients of your models or however your models are with the names. And it's all in the model. So you could like make graphs <laughs> like, <laughs> without doing something complicated. So, um, try it out. It's on. Uh, we have a we have a um, index that hosts the the dev version of SciPy, so anyone can install it today to try it out. Um, yeah, that, um, here it's a long one command. It's one one command there. All right. Thanks. Thanks for listening. <laughs> All right, thank you, Thomas. So far, we haven't had anyone uh, go over the time limit, which means I'm doing a great job. Uh, Cameron is, I think, not here, so we will go with, have you heard of DBT? Cool. All right, while he's coming up here, uh, I realized my job was actually to talk while they set up, right? So I'm not supposed to stare at the screen along with you guys. Uh, that was awkward. <laughs> Okay, yeah, we're still waiting. Um, <laughs> I, I could not pronounce your name, sorry. Burkai. All right, guys, give it up for Burkai. Burkai. Yes. All right, so these are my slides. This is it. Have you heard of DBT? It was very quickly put together. So um, I'm Burkai. I'm from a company called FAL. Features and labels for short. And um, I went around this pie data. It's my first pie data. Very exciting. I went around and uh, asking this question Have you heard of DBT? Because a lot of people that I interact with, which come from like analytics, BI background, work with DBT a lot. But a lot of the times I ask this question, I heard a lot of like, I haven't heard of it. Or I heard about it, but I don't know what it does. So I'm here to. Uh, actually commit the cardinal sin, because this is a SQL-based tool in the, in the PyData conference, uh, and, and show you a little bit about it. So um, let's, let's, let's give it a shot, live demo. So um, 
Uh, here's uh, um, the starter demo for DBT, which is called Jaffle Shop. So it's a fictional uh, sandwich shop. Uh, I think Jaffle is how they call grilled cheese in Australia. Um, so um, in this uh, fictional uh, e-commerce store, um, we have some data. We want to load it up into a data warehouse like Snowflake, or in this case, I'm using DuckDB. Um, and then do some transformations on it. Um, so with DBT, you can get started very easily. Like you can just pull this project, and then you configure your connection uh, to your data warehouse very, very easily. So here I have my profiles YAML, which like stands in my home directory. And don't look at my credentials for anything else. But I, I define my DuckDB connection right here. Uh, so it's very simple, right? And from here on. All I have to do is actually write some SQL. Uh, so I have my models folder here, and I just have a SQL query um, here. And you know, typically, like what you have to do to just get this done is like start a connection and then like really sequence your SQL queries and do some orchestration to just do some uh, basic transformations in your data warehouse. What DBT helps with is like this is all done for you. So I have my project now. I can load my data with dbt seed, and then, uh, so this is loading my data, and then I can do dbt docs serve, and this will serve uh, and show me like what my graph, my SQL transformation graph looks like. And here I can go here, so I have some like upstream raw data, and then I have some staging um, tables, and then I have my customers and orders tables that I'm defined that I've defined here. Uh, so this is all cool and you know it, it's great. But like we, we asked this question, it's like this tool is really awesome, super simple to use. Um, but what's in it for us? What's in it for the data scientists? And so um, as of DBT 1.3, there's actually support for Python models. So instead of defining your models in SQL, you can also define your models in Python. So and that's where we come in. So at FAL, we're building a Python runtime for uh, DBT. So you can attach your profiles uh, YAML, so in this case, DuckDB. Uh, and I'm just configuring FAL as my output. And now, with DuckDB, I can also run uh, Python models. So just to show an example of that, um, you know, imagine it's like year two of the Jaffle Shop, our e-commerce store. And I want to now do some fancier things, uh, like make a forecast. So if I rename this file like that, and then after my here's my like Python model, which ingests from an upstream uh, table, um, and I can just refer to it like this, very simple. And you know, there's some like profit, of course, uh, to like do a simple forecast, and. I have some more downstream transformations happening in uh, SQL. So this is like after that Python model. And once I have this like typical DuckDB run would actually fail. But in this case, I can just run this. And because I'm using file, um, it'll, it'll run Python models um, in the middle of my DAG. Um, oops. <laughs> All right, this, this had to happen, right? Uh, but yeah, just take my word for it that it works. <laughs> um, thank you, thank you, thank you. So that's it. Yeah, give us a star here at fallai slash fall. Thank you, Burkai. Next up, we have Eric Walsh for Graph Blast and NetworkX. Yeah, but Cameron's first, obviously. <laughs> yeah. All right, while they try, I'd like to brag about something today. We had code duels um, in Radio City just uh, before this, around 2.15, I think. Uh, Thomas and I went head to head. It was an intense battle, which was the hardest uh, type, type tier, hardest tier of question, and we actually drew. So, yeah, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. You have someone who, in front of you who drew with Thomas, so 
I guess clap one more time for me. <laughs> Appreciation, I like it. All right, cool, Cameron. Almost, almost. All right, guys. My talk is titled Matplotlib, Not Just a Plotting Tool. All right, all of the images that you see here were not made using Seaborn. They were not made using Network X, nothing else. And all of these plots were made between last night and uh, five seconds ago. <laughs> but for those of you who don't know me, my name is Cameron Rudell. I have helped organize this conference, taking care of things for the sprints, taking care of things for our keynotes, and all of the fun behind the scenes stuff. This is actually my first in-person PyData conference, so thank you so much for having me here. All right, what is the most basic thing you can make in Matplotlib? Well, the documentation always says it's sign and cosine. I think that's used every single place in the documentation, but that's not my opinion. Matplotlib is not just a plotting library, right? In my opinion, the most basic thing you can make is a circle, right? We have patches that do that, and what I can even do with the circle, well, I can add a rectangle under it. And if I keep adding layers, we end up with a beautiful stick figure. <laughs> Matplotlib is not just a plotting tool. I can make actual art with Matplotlib. So my challenge to you all who use Matplotlib and you say import matplotlib.pyplot as plt, and then as soon as you see plt.plot doesn't give you what you want, you say, oh, no, Matplotlib cannot do what I want. Yes, it can. You just have to keep digging. <laughs> Matplotlib is very dense. You need to dig through and find out in order to leverage all of the power and all of the control it gives you. You can visualize networks. Network X uses Matplotlib under the hood. You can even add animations, crude animations to your plots. If I had more time, this would be a lot shinier. But what you can see is I just use four circles here to represent different nodes. I use lines with a different line style, and then I update that line style in order to make it appear like those lines are moving. I could even increase the size of the recipient circles, the child nodes, and there you have it, a distribution or a visualization of something like a load distributor, right? Matplotlib is not just for plotting. You can even make tables. These are pretty hot on Twitter right now, and I think uh, MPL tables is a brand new package that somebody has made. I did not use MPL tables following my, uh, my original preface. Instead, this is actually one matplotlib figure with 15 different sets of axes that I all made invisible. I put a single text on each of those axes right in the center, and then I created a, I took off all of the spines. Matplotlib is not for plotting. You can be so creative with all the things that you can do with Matplotlib. When you're free from just a plotting API, you're truly only limited by your creativity. A heat map is something that is very widely used in order to represent some 2D data. Commonly, right, people use these to represent correlation maps. Obviously, there's not a correlational matrix because it's not square, and also there's no main diagonal. But if this were a correlation matrix, whenever I see a heat map like this, my eyes glaze over just a little bit because I have no idea what you want me to look at. Instead, we can use tricks like redundant signal encoding in order to convey stronger messages. I am encoding the strength in both color and size, and now you can very easily tell, oh, which ones do I not care about, which ones do I care about? You can use this in statistics. Instead of redundantly encoding the same signal, you can encode the size as a p-value right, instead of just the strength of the, the result in R of your Pearson correlation. Matplotlib is not just a plotting tool. Everything that you saw here today was done in Matplotlib, and I hope this is a surprise because this is not a slideshow. This is not PowerPoint, this is not Google Slides, this is Matplotlib that is just waiting for me to enter key presses, and every time I press a button, it goes to the next slide, so please nobody ask me to go backwards because I cannot do that. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. My name is Cameron Riddell. You can follow me on Twitter, at RiddleMeCam. I post data viz all the time, and I absolutely love Matplotlib, and hope to see you all more. Show them the code. <laughs> this is the, all the code that I wrote, 272 lines between last night and today. You can see my slides are broken up into my main slides, my wrap-up slides there, and they are all just functions that operate on the one figure that I created at the beginning of my program. That's awesome. <laughs> no, it really is. Um, 
Also, did you guys know Cameron lost to Thomas? <laughs> just, just saying. Uh, but to be fair, when I did draw against Thomas, then Cameron was coaching me and three other people. Uh, but we were a good team. Um, right now, we have Eric Welch for Graph Blast and Network X. Uh, hi there. I have a lot of talks, so no introductions. I'm just going to talk to you about uh, Graph Loss and Network X. Uh, my five second pitch is if you've ever wanted Network X to be faster, uh, come check out what we're doing with Graph Loss. I work at NVIDIA on the Rapids project. Uh, so you may be familiar with some of the uh, letters in this. The BLAS looks familiar. Um, so from the 70s, from basic linear algebra subprograms. That's how they named things in the 70s. Uh, so Graph Loss must be that, but for graphs, it's newer, it's more modern. And this uses an equivalence that, um, that's been known for a long time, that like, sparse linear algebra problem is equivalent to graph problems and vice versa, uh, versa if you have the right mathematics to make that equivalence. And this is often done with an adjacency matrix. Not always. There are other matrices. And here we're doing a, um, a one traversal step from node 4 to its out edges to uh, the, the neighboring nodes one and three. Like we're just doing a matrix multiply from the uh, uh, sparse A with the sparse V. Uh, we also often think of the blasts as being fast. Like these are the kernels that people wrote a long time ago that like we don't need to think about. Uh, it's the same for graph blasts. It's uh, low level. So these are building blocks uh, for building kind of higher level uh, applications, higher level algorithms. Uh, but I would, like, it's also high level. Like these let you think about how to express things in the terms of linear algebra. Um, like there's a lot of low level code about how to uh, properly run these on hardware that you should never like. We don't need to read that Fortran code or like in graph loss, Like it's very complicated uh, how they do the data structures. Um, so here's a few uh, examples in graph loss of a few algorithms: uh, single source, shortest path. Um, it's pretty dense, there's a lot of syntax, I can't go into detail, uh, but the frontier here is a vector, and the A is a matrix, and we're doing the Python matrix multiply, and we're changing what the matrix multiply means, instead of doing like the normal, like multiplying the elements and adding them together with the summation, we're doing like uh, min plus as opposed to plus times, and we're doing an accumulation back into frontier with the minimum uh, min. Uh, for parent BFS, like we need to use masking. Uh, so masking in the operations is essential for work efficiency. Um, uh, and now trying to connect the dots with Network X. Like, what is Network X? It's on that uh, uh, slide there. You all probably know it. It's the uh, most common, uh, popular uh, graph library in Python. It's a I would describe it as a great reference. Uh, uh, of algorithms in Python. Uh, so it's well known, it's popular, like there's a lot of algorithms. It's very well documented, well tested, and like it's nice to read, and it's great for small graphs. It's a big problem. It was not meant for large graphs, so it's pretty slow. Uh, so I think we need a foundational, like sparse library that is fast, flexible, scalable, can run anywhere, and is able to handle uh, graph problems. And I'm going to throw down the gauntlet in saying that uh, sci-fi sparse is not that library. Um, no time to go into detail here. Like, yes, there is the, the sci-fi sparse CS graph. We're doing graph uh, algorithms on sci-fi sparse algorithms or, or objects. Uh, but it's fundamentally the wrong object model. It's the wrong API for doing graph things. And even for algorithms where um, it, that is not for me. Um, <laughs> it can do well, like PageRank. Uh, it's a lot slower than state-of-the-art algorithms. Like graph loss can be 20 times faster or more than just on the CPU. On the GPU, I'd expect it to be way faster than that. Um, and so, yes, I'm going to say graph loss can be that foundational library. However, like, it's hard to build a new foundational library. It's hard to connect to where the users are. And so what can we do? Like, let's work with Network X. This is where the users are. And so coming in Network X 3.0, the code freeze was today. It's, this will be released in a few days, probably, uh, is dispatching. So we can uh, introducing dispatching of algorithms to different backends. Uh, from the start, we'll have the, uh, a graph loss backend and a KuGraph backend. Um, so graph loss algorithms is our library that um, implements the Network X, X API. 
and we will be able to run on like CPU, soon GPU, and a bit after that uh, with Dask. So this is our um, like software volcano. Uh, I love Thomas Coswell's um, image from yesterday. This has the imagery of exploding out into the uh, applications. And so I'm stuck in this software layer, but I think there's so many really cool things that like the map, social sciences, genomics, disease propagation, wonder why uh, that will be relevant. Um, and even just like regular business. So check it out. Cool. Is this, oh, this mic is working. All right. Uh, next up, we have David Charleswick. How cold spins up a Dask cluster? David, are you in the room? I'm not sure if you're David. Are you David? He's not. All right. Um, if he's not, we have intro to CAD CAD. All right. Come right up. So we have Emmanuel for intro to CAD CAD, and next up we have incons inconsistent and incoherent Juan Luis. All right. Rude. Me? You call them inconsistent and incoherent? My title, my title <laughs> Right, so I was supposed to have a joke for this time, I guess, um, which I don't. So, anyone in the audience have a nice short joke, one-liner? Good fun. Did you hear the one about the broken pencil? No. That's pointless. Oh. So. <laughs> one more. Did you hear the joke about time travel? No. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's HDMI, yeah. <laughs> okay, I think we can do a couple more because this is taking a while. What's the difference between a scalar and a vector? I think I would have to bring the. Nice. All right, I, I kind of think it was the mosquito thing, it kind of flew over my head, but we have Emmanuel. Okay. Um. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Emmanuel Lima, and I'm going to talk to you guys about CAD-CAD, a working in progress modeling library for generalized dynamical systems. So this is just a little bit about me. I am a research software engineer at Block Science, and I am the lead engineer for, for CAD-CAD. So um, first of all, what is CAD-CAD? So basically, CAD-CAD stands for Complex Adaptive Dynamics Computer Aided Design. And that is just a mouthful for, for saying that CAD-CAD is an open source framework for generalized dynamical system. And what we are working on right now, the effort that is more uh, advanced, is our reference implementation in Python, but we are also working on other implementations in other languages such as Julia, for example. So basically, what is a dynamical system? The dynamical system is the, the mathematical representation of an observed phenomena that has a certain state, that is the snapshot of the attributes of a system, and rules about the time evolution of that system. And that dynamical system comes in various flavors, like, like for example, the, the one that we have on this equation here is a time discrete um, dynamical system. But then we went a step forward, and now we have generalized dynamical systems, that basically, instead of having a uh, system that evolves basically a real number or a set of real numbers. Now we have a gener generalized version of that theory that uh, deals with the evolving of a generic data record. And for example, as you can see on this uh, type, three, type three here, um, the, the data record can have any kind of types that one may want, so you, do not, you are not stuck to floats, basically. And so that was the first, con um, this, was, this is the first main concept of CAD CAD. So you can have the data records, and those data records we call spaces. Uh, the second main concept in CAD CAD and in GDS is the concept of a block. So basically, the block is the main logic that is going to say how the system is going to evolve over time. 
And those blocks are those uh, are gray boxes on this diagram here. And you can see that we can uh, make them together or join them according to their domains and codomains, the, the colored circles. And we can put them together like Legos. So you can make an arbitrarily complex wiring of blocks, or rather wiring of logics, to have a, an arbitrarily complex time evolution of a system or of a generic data record, basically. And all of that uh, uh, goes back to those three uh, uh, small concepts here. So the first one is tearing. So um, I can, if I look at this diagram here, I can look at the whole diagram and just look at it all as the same, just one big block or just one big logic. Or I can tear this one big logic uh, into their small constituents. There are those small gray boxes, and that's the process of tearing. And then there is the process of zooming, where I am concerned only with the internal logic of each of those gray boxes, and I want to model only the gray boxes. And the process of linking, that is the process of um, joining each of those blocks together, because basically, the output of one of those blocks has to be the same as the input of the next block. So by doing that, I can make like arbitrarily long pipelines or wires of data transformations for those data records that I just showed. So basically, uh, our main um, motivation for doing CAD-CAD was uh, systems engineers and mechanism designers were using like very expensive proprietary software for modeling and uh, we wanted to have an open source alternative for it. And this is just a, 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 a little bit of the syntax that one can use to make those wires in CAD-CAD. So the space is a decorator over a class that says the data record. The block is a decorator over a regular Python function that says the logic of the time evolution of the system. And then you have some small boilerplate to create the experiment, run the experiment, and then you can produce, for example, in this small example, this random walk. That's just a, a chaotic uh, dynamical system. And this is a, just some pointers, some links in case you guys want to learn more and uh, in case you guys want to, to, to check out our progress. We are at github.com slash catcad.org slash catcadri. Thank you very much. All right. So. Inconsistent and incoherent. Juan Luis is here. Uh, I saw Juan Juan's talk in uh, PyData London. Which one? The, the one about the Pandas logos. Do you know the story about the Pandas logo? Now I do. And I actually have a survey um, that I want to do at the end, so stick around. Um, OK, so you can put the timer because. Oh, your screen's not up. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm not supposed to talk a lot, but you can put the timer anyway, because I want to preface this by saying that I want to make a talk that relies on a weird display setup and audio on Linux and Steam on Linux, so everything can go wrong. Absolutely everything. If it works, it's going to be a miracle. So allow me one moment to set up the things. The HDMI one is active. So what about doing this? Is this going to work? I have no idea what I'm doing. But I promise that it's worth it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, nah, it was the other way around, right? <laughs> no, it's not going to work. So you're going to see the whole thing. So first thing that doesn't work, there we go. Second thing, uh, this timer is incorrect, probably like four minutes now. So <laughs> let's do that. Third thing. Yesterday it was said that we are too serious in the Python community. 
So I want to do something completely different. That was a Monty Python joke, in case you didn't get it. It's because you are too young. <laughs> also, young people, you can watch Monty Python. It's good. It's old, but it's good. Um, OK, can we? You don't hear that, right? Oh, yeah, we do. Uh, just oh, no. no. That's there. Where is the... Oh, is it coming out of the laptop? Can you hold it? So it's like... Can someone hold it? I only have one hand. <laughs> <laughs> okay, third thing that doesn't work, HDMI audio. Now let's try something else. Kids, the music is old, but it's good.
All right. Um, so now we have James Powell, words I may have made up. And actually, I just have one joke that I actually thought for today. Just for James? Yeah, just for James. So what do you call it when James moves from his seat to the podium? Nobody? All right. It's called Powell Movement. <laughs> okay, let's get this going. You give me a moment. Okay, I hope everybody is enjoying themselves as we make it to the end of the second day of Piety in New York 2022. I know I have had a blast and I am now beginning to remember why it is that I came to these kind of things in the first place. This is my lightning talk. It is titled, Words I May Have Made Up. We're at Pi Data at New York City. It is Thursday, November 10th, 2022. I'm James Powell. If you like this, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, or not. I mean, I don't care that much. Uh, let's take a look. So it turns out I am so insufferable, I cannot stop making up new terms for things that already exist. For example, you may have heard me talk about the nominal decomposition of a bounded modality. That's what a class method basically is. Or pumping or priming a coroutine, or the subjectivity of homogeneity. That's what happens when you stack or unstack a panda's data frame. Sometimes I just repurpose or jumble up words that already exist. Like when I talk to people about the fundamental ambiguity of in-band encodings, that's why we need the capital I N64 and pandas. Or that coroutines allow you to lexically linearize control and data flow, so you can represent state machines in a different formulation. Or that there exists in Python such thing as a lowercase c, uppercase c, coroutine, coroutine. But that's not my fault. That's actually the fault of the pandas, I mean of the, uh, not the pandas documentation, the Python documentation, because this is what we used to call a coroutine with the lowercase c. But this is what the documentation calls a coroutine with a capital T, like collection.abc.coroutine. And so that would mean that this would be a lowercase c, coroutine, capital C, coroutine. Mm. It's not my fault. It's their fault for the documentation. But today we're going to talk about another word that I believe I may have made up. The term is the restricted computation domain. Here is the scenario. You are using pure Python. And you write a Python class to represent some datum. Not data, but datum. Some singular entity. It has an X and a Y. It has two pieces of data associated with it. And you create a collection of these datum into one piece of data. And you compute some operation on it, for example, the mean. And when you do that, you say, well, you know what? Everything seems to be so big. I'm running out of memory really quickly. And the reason for that is, if you look at the size of an integer in Python, it's 24 bytes. But hold on a second. Isn't this an in 64? So there's only be eight bytes in size. Where are the other 16 bytes going? And if you think about it, uh, we would think that a two integers would be about double this, 48 bytes. And so a tuple of one integer would be 48 bytes. So there's some overhead with the tuple. And a tuple of two integers, actually, that's not so bad. I'm not seeing that much overhead for just the tuple itself. But when you take a look at your datum class and you try and figure out how big it is, you'll see that it's also 48 bytes. But that seems to be kind of strange, because if I add a lot more elements in it, oh, hold on a second. That's not measuring the size of the entire data. That's just measuring the size of the collection. And so in order to actually model two integers, I'm paying 48 bytes plus the 48 bytes of the original integer. That is a lot of memory that I'm spending to store basically 16 bytes worth of data. And you say to yourself, there's got to be a better way than this. But one thing that you already got wrong is Python integers are not 64-bit integers. There is no such thing as an in64 in Python. In fact, Python integers automatically promote. This is why you can take an integer and raise it to the 20th power, or the 200th power, or the 2,000th power, or the 20,000th power. They automatically promote. They have no fixed size. And in fact, their modeling internally is very strange. Here's the thing. They're not two's complement. They're some weird sign magnitude representation. They're a C array of in32 digits. But you set all of that aside and say, you know what? My solution is I'll use slots, because I've told that slots makes everything better, except slots is actually pretty useless. It doesn't really help you in any real way. In fact, it doesn't even make this thing smaller. Slots is marginally interesting, but slots means you're going down the wrong path. Because it turns out that even if you try your hardest, you cannot control memory layout in pure Python. Python does not give you the ability to do that, with the small exception of the array module in Python, which I don't think anybody actually uses. Well, it turns out that what you're going to do 
is you're going to say, I'm going to create a special manager class. It represents the collection of all of my data, a data set class. And I'm going to construct it by passing in my individual datum. And this is what the code's going to look like originally. And then once you do that, you're going to say, you know what's going to happen? I'm going to start absorbing more functionality into this data set class, like the mean method. I'll implement it inside the class. And so I'll call it from the outside. So instead of having these operations that appear at the pure Python level, I'm kind of pushing these operations into the manager class. The data set is responsible for constructing itself. It's responsible for computing the mean. Well, that's basically what a restricted computation domain is. It's the idea of taking the code that you have, and instead of modeling the individual entities at the pure Python level, you create some sort of manager class that models the entities themselves. And it turns out that when you do this, you can start doing things like dropping mechanisms down to the C layer and recovering your ability to exact memory layout. Who cares about this? Well, it turns out that if you have a restricted computation domain, if you have one of these manager classes, you can do full control over encoding a memory layout. In fact, if you look at a NumPy and DRA, you'll see it is just a restricted computation domain that allows you to take a raw view of, of memory and add an interpretive layer like the shape, the strides, or the D-type. This is why, for example, NumPy and DRA has certain limitations because it's a raw view of memory. You can't grow it. You have to actually copy it over. This is why we say, for example, that a list is fixed shape and dynamic size in a NumPy and DRA is dynamic shape and fixed size because you can change the interpretation layer. And that's mostly free. We like to say that it's free like a glass of water in a European restaurant. You're still going to pay for it, but not a whole lot. <laughs> now, it turns out that when you have this NumPy and DRA, you can do some kind of tricks with it. Like you can swap out the interpretive layer. So you can take something that thinks that it contains in 64s and tell it actually contains in 32s. You can even see the endiness of the computer here. You can see that it's reinterpreting this data. Well, it turns out that you can also do things like eliminate dynamic dispatch and data dependencies. For example, <laughs> well, there you go. All right, thank you, James. Cool. Uh, so we actually had only 10 slots for this lightning talk, but people were so interested that they put two extra slots just by themselves. Uh, so let's see if those people are actually here. One more slot. OK, we can do one more. So sorry if you're 12. Three minutes. It's fine. What? I only need two to three minutes. OK, she only needs two to three minutes. And you are? I'm Chen. Chen, cool. Teaching data science in Africa. I don't know, it's not on my computer, by the way. Um, <laughs> but it works before. If it works, it works. Ago. I hope it works, still works. Or you can take off the mask. It works on this computer before. It it's not even oh, Hold on, okay. We got it. All right, let's right, go. Okay, fine. Let's, let's go. Let's go quick. Uh, so I'm just going to tell you one thing that uh, I have teach data science in Africa, in Pakon, Ghana. Woo. So, uh, what is happening is that uh, we have Humble Data Workshop. So what is Humble Data Workshop? It's a self-paced data science workshop for absolute beginners. So you know you have a bunch of Jupyter Notebook and people can work on it by themselves. They learn from absolutely zero. They, like, they have never coded one single line of Python previously in their life. They're absolute beginners, but they can start. And then eventually, they will go to like, plot some graphs with Maplelib. So it's really cool. Um, so what we also want to do is to kickstart a community by bringing mentors and mentees together. So uh, that's why we really want to have like, people sit together to work together. Uh, so the, the mentor and mentee, they can build up some kind of relationship, like you know, friendship. And you know, they can also help each other in the future. Um, also, we try to get all the mentees. Uh, uh, after they are finished, they will become mentors in the next event. So they will feel uh, encouraged and empowered because now they're teaching some other people, which like, you know, they also understand what like, people may get tripped over before because they have experienced that themselves before. So uh, we started in 2020 uh, by uh, a few friends, so like a few friends of mine. Also, we, we know each other because of PyData. We sit together, we create this, uh, all these materials. We have actually bring it online before. Uh, PyData Global is coming. But, well, we're not doing PyData Global this year, but we have done it before. Uh, also, PyCon US, uh, we have bring it to PyCon US also online. PyCon Africa also online. Uh, you know, Africa, doing things online is very challenging. So. Uh, but since now the world is open again, we have done it in, in person. We have done it in uh, Euro Python, which is kind of like the main Python conference in Europe. And also, I, I've just done it last month in Ghana, which is amazing. See these uh, pictures, these beautiful faces, like people smiling and so happy. And like that, that, that's the one uh, on the right hand side, right? The left hand side, people are like working so hard, you know, scratching their head, and uh, all the mentors are really like trying to help. So that's really, really good. And so things I've learned is that um, I, I, 
I managed to make it happen because the, there's a very amazing like local organizing team there, so they really like helped me out a lot. And you thought like, oh, Ghana, you know, it's a very far place. I don't know the local community there, but once you make the connection, and people there are really, really like willing to help. So uh, also, there's a lot of mentors. They are recruited by the local organizers, and they're all like very helpful. They even help them to like install the the uh, the the, the uh, environment the day before. So we have uh, the install installation party. It was a big success. Actually, it's a lifesaver because people who hasn't been to the party and come with a computer that doesn't have a Python running is really challenging. So uh, we are really happy, and people are really like grateful, and like you know, there's so many people come back to me and like being so happy as like, oh, thank you so much. Like, we really love this. So um, how we can help? So uh, for example, if you have any like, local communities that you have a bunch of people you want to teach data science from scratch to, to them, so uh, let, let us know. So maybe we can like see how we can have uh, humble data at your local community. Um, also, uh, all the materials are open source. You can go there. You can update it, proofread it, uh, you know. Because I'm sure that like some of you sitting here are very experienced in data science, so you can help. Also, if you si speak other languages, I have a dream that like if we can translate the virtual material in Spanish, we can bring it to Latin America. And wow, Ooh. I want to go there. So, or maybe you can go, come with me. Um, also, organizing events. So again, if you know the local community or you're part of the local community, if you want to organize humble data, let me know, and we'll see how we can work together. Uh, also, financial sponsorship. So my trip to Pagong, Ghana. Uh, I need to thank uh, my employer, uh, Alaconda. So it's like they uh, they support me and help me to be there. We also sponsor some of the uh, attendees as well to attend the conference, attend the workshop. So really thankful for them. So if your employer also want to like you know help uh, to spread data science, you know talk to me. We'll see how we can work together. So uh, that's it uh, from this talk. Thank you so much. <laughs>